Alrighty, welcome back again to computational problem solving using Rust, presented by the Carpenter Tutoring. Um, just as a recap, if you're new to this course, we're using this right here as sort of the guide for how this course is structured, the practice of computing using Python. Um, the course, of course, is not being taught in Python, it's being taught in Rust, and we covered a little bit about why and how that's going to work in some of our previous chapters. Um, additional information for this course is provided by the Rust Lang book. It's a wonderful resource for people who are not new to programming, but who are new to Rust to learn how it works. Um, but I'm trying to gear it towards people who are new to programming. So in the last chapter, you learned uh, a little bit about what it's like to be a programmer, uh, some of the things that are useful to know, like types and memory and how the, the human computer interface sort of works. Uh, but in this chapter, we're going to dive head first in the deep end, we're going to start to program. Um, and that's really because I think the best way to learn is by practicing. Um, slides only get so far for me personally, learning how to program something, you kind of sort of need to get your hands dirty a little bit. Um, and that means we're going to see a full working program from the start, and then we're going to break that down piece by piece into its components so that you can hopefully understand its entirety. So if we get to the next couple of slides and you see the program for the first time and it doesn't all make sense, that's okay. We're going to dive into it. So let's let's recap what we learned last time. In order to dive into our problem solving questions or issues, we also need to dive into language issues, right? Because a program is a human readable essay on problem solving. We kind of made that like rule number two um, that program just happens to also run on the computer. So in order to translate our thoughts, uh, we have to learn a programming language. And then of course, rule number one is think before you program. Before you even sit down and start attacking the keyboard, it's good to figure out what you want to do. Come up with your, your mental picture of how you're going to solve your problem, and then worry about translating it so that you know, somebody else can read it, uh, and then a computer can run it. So let's come up with a problem. Um, but before we do that, we're going to add another rule. <laughs> rule number three, the best way to improve your programming on problem solving skills uh, is to practice. So programming and problem solving skills, got to practice them. That's why we're going to jump head first, deep end. Uh, we're going to learn how to write a program by writing a program. So learning to experiment is very important. If you check out the last sort of very small video about how to actually get the tool set up that you need to try experimenting on your, your workstation, uh, that would be, this would be a great time to go and check that out if you haven't already. But it's, it's the kind of thing where if you have a question, go try it out. You know, go open up the playground, try something out on your computer, see what the compiler says. That's going to be the best way to learn. And that's what we're going to do here. So now let's actually get to our problem. We want to calculate the circumference and the area of a circle using its radius as input. So super basic math. I don't like math. I'm terrible at it. But I remember this well enough. Hopefully you do too. Uh, we have a couple of formulas here for doing that. So thinking through before we even start programming, we know what we're going to have to do to actually calculate these values. So if you're given a radius, right, your circumference is going to be that radius times the value pi times 2. Um, and pi is, of course, that very, 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 very long number, 3.14 something, something, something. And we're going to use that here. And I'll show you how we can use resources that are available to us as programmers to make that easier. Um, and then, of course, the area calculation, we have pi again. And then we multiply that by the square of the radius, so radius to the second power. Now, that's what we need to calculate, but there are some other things that we actually need to do to solve our problem. There are things that we need to do in our program to actually make that happen. And here they are. We have additional requirements. We need to prompt the user for a radius, right? We need to get information from a user. The radius could be, it, it's variable. We don't know what it is yet. So we need to ask for it. We also need to take whatever the user provides and transform it into a number that we can run those calculations with. Uh, you're going to learn very, very quickly that users don't always provide what you ask for. Um, 
what happens if somebody types in the letter A instead of a number? We need to actually account for things like that. And that's part of our problem solving is accounting for uh, potential errors and handling them uh, and edge cases, right? The weird little, but what if this happens type of things. We're gonna talk a little bit about error handling here. Uh, we're going to leave probably a lot of edge cases on the table for this exercise, but that's okay. The third thing that we need is to actually apply those formulas that we have up here, right? We knew we needed to do that. And then the final thing we need to do is we need to actually print those things out. They can't just sit in our computer memory. They have to show up in front of the user screen, on the screen, excuse me. Uh, even if that user is you, right? You wanna be able to do something with that information. It's the whole point about writing this program is solving some kind of a problem, get, putting information in and getting information out. So let's actually take a look at a program that we can use to do this. And here it is. So this might look very daunting at first glance, but we're going to take it step by step. We're gonna look at every single piece of it and you're gonna see that it's actually broken down pretty logically. But the first thing that I'm going to do is I'm actually going to run this just so that you can see what it does. So let's go in there into chapter two and you'll see that I have this file called circumference.rs. All of our Rust programs are just going to end in .rs. That lets us run them through the Rust compiler, RustC. If you're on Windows, it's called rustc.exe. You can usually run it in command prompt. If you're on a Mac, it's gonna look more or less like this. You just type in rustc, you give it the name of the file that you want to compile. It's going to run, it's not gonna say anything. And then if you look in the folder that you ran that in, you're going to see this little executable file called circumference. Uh, if you're on Windows, again, it might be circumference.exe, but that is your program. That is the Rust compiler taking what you wrote and turning it into something you can run. Um, and that step is going to happen for every single program we write in between us writing it and us running it. It's just the way that it works. And we talked a little bit about that in previous chapters if you wanna go back and review. So there's our program. Now we can actually run it. And of course you could double click it if you wanted to. Sometimes uh, you usually you can just type the name in the command line like this. I recommend getting familiar with this way of doing things just because it's, it's a lot easier to just quickly type the thing out and hit enter. Uh, and you'll see that it starts running. So here's our program. We're going to actually calculate what we want to calculate, right? The circumference in the area uh, based on the radius. And so immediately it asks us for the radius. Uh, and let's go ahead and provide that. Let's just say our radius is three. And you can see here, it printed out all of those results and it closed and it dropped us back into our prompt before. So our circumference is 18.849 uh, and the area is 28.27, et cetera, et cetera. Um, you can do the math really quickly on a notepad if you want to verify that it's correct, but uh, I'm fairly certain that it's correct. Actually, one way that we could try that is, let's go ahead and run it. I believe if you give a radius of two, your circumference and your area come out to the same value. Uh, yes, and, and it is. Okay, so I still remember something from math class, um, but there you go. There's our program. It does something useful. Now let's go and take a deeper look at it and actually figure out how does it work. So here's it. Here's, this is the file. This is our little circumference.rs. This is what we're feeding into the compiler and turning into that program that we just ran. So from top to bottom, what's going on here? You already see a couple of strange looking little statements at the top, these use statements. This is how we use other programmers code inside of our programs. Um, there's a lot of times where somebody else has already solved one problem a lot faster and better than we have, and we want to reuse their work. We don't want to invent everything from scratch. Anytime that you see a use statement, you know that you are importing somebody else's code and using it in your program. In this case, let's look at what we're importing. On the first line here, we're using standard F64 constants pi. This is just a number. This is just the number pi. Um, 
it comes from this path, right? Standard meaning the standard Rust library. That is a library provided by the people who actually make the Rust programming language. We can use that in every program, um, but the standard library has a bunch of information on numbers, a bunch of functions we can use, input, output, all kinds of great stuff. And here we're just saying, use a floating point constant known as pi, uh, and that is the big 3.1415, et cetera, et cetera. So here we're just saying, hey, take the number pi and bring it into our program so that we don't have to type out the big long pi number. Super, super simple. Uh, and if you want to know what else is available to you, uh, I'll go ahead and show you the link here. We've got, uh, I believe it's docs.rust-lang.org. Uh, here you can see everything inside of that standard library. So if you're ever experimenting and you just want to know, what is that thing that I used? You can go here, you can search, you can find. Here's our constant that we just used, pi. Here's the big long number that it puts in our program for us that we don't even have to think about. It's very, very nice. This is a great resource. Go ahead and bookmark it. You can always go and find more information here. And we're going to worry about more of this later and what all of these things mean and stuff like that. But for right now, you at least know about it and you can go and search for things here if you don't fully understand them. So that's the first thing that we're borrowing to use in our program here. The second thing we're borrowing is this other standard library module called IO standard in. The IO section of that path is basically everything that Rust provides us for doing input output. That's user input, um, that's printing things to the screen, that's taking things in from the keyboard, all of that stuff comes from there. And then we've also got the, th the thing we're actually importing is the standard in function. Standard in is what we use to get somebody who's typing on the keyboard to get what they're typing to come into our program so that we can actually do something with that data. And we'll see what that looks like when we use it inside inside this, this uh, program here. So these are the only two things that we're borrowing here. Everything else here we're writing from scratch. So now we can take a look at the main portion of our program. Note, I have a bunch of lines in here that have these little double forward slashes on them. Those are comments. They don't actually do anything. They're just there. Remember, this is a human readable essay. Um, and as I mentioned before, we want to make our programs so that human beings can read them um, and also computers can run them. But computers running them is secondary. We want humans to be able to read them. Comments are a great way of doing that. Every time you see these double forward slashes here, you know, that's just useful information for me to remember what I did, to talk about how I'm solving a problem, to say why somebody may or may not want to do something. That's all that's there for. So we can safely ignore these because Rust is safely going to ignore these, but you can see that it helps give context. If you didn't know what this program did, this comment right here tells you exactly what it does, which is very useful. And that comment is right over top of the start to our program, the main function. Anytime that you see this little FN in Rust, you're creating a new function, uh, you give it a name, follow it by these parentheses, which may or may not have some arguments in them. And then you open this little curly brace and you begin your program. Now, if you don't know anything about functions and arguments and things like that, remember, we're going to cover all of this later. We're diving in head first. Try and see what you understand and what you don't to get ready for learning the next couple of chapters. But we're just looking at the program in its entirety right now, and then we're going to break it down piece by piece. So. Just to recap, this is our main function. This is always where our REST code starts. Every time we write a program, this is the first thing that's going to run. And in this case, our entire program is inside of main. But you'll learn later that you can write additional functions and call them from main. All right, we got another comment telling us what this next section is going to do. We're going to prompt for our radius input. These next three lines are going to do that. That's everything that you need to actually ask the user, hey, give me a radius, and then to accept one from them on standard input. Now, how are we going to solve that problem? What are we actually doing here? First of all, we're creating a new string. 
you learn in a previous chapter that strings are just sort of blocks of text in memory, right? Um, and here we're providing a new empty string as the starting value to a variable. And that variable is called input. This is a way for us to keep track of the different information that we want to store inside of our program. We have variables. Just like we had the constant up here, pi, right, which we're going to use later, that's a constant that does not change, but it has value. This is a value that can change. And we're even specifying with this little keyword here, mute. This is a value that's going to change very soon. As a matter of fact, in Rust, everything is not mutable by default. So when we create a variable like this, usually we would just say let input, and then we would assign it to something. Everything to the right of this equal sign is how we assign it a value. But this time we're saying, go ahead and let it, let it be mutable. We want somebody to be able to change this in this code later. And that kind of makes sense because the input is going to have something from the user dropped into it, right? It has to change. That's its only purpose. And then what do we assign it? We assign it a new empty string. And you'll learn more about how these functions are called later. Essentially what this does is it just says, hey, give me a string from scratch, an empty one. And that's what this does. So now we need to actually ask the user for something. And that means more input output. That means we're going to print a message to the user. And here's how we do that. We have this macro here, print line, with a little exclamation point at the end. You're already starting to get confused by this syntax. I don't blame you. It's kind of weird. We have little colons and exclamation points and, and curly braces, all kinds of weird stuff's going on. But this is more or less the same thing as a function. Um, it has a couple of clever tricks behind it that make your life easier. But really all this does is it takes whatever string, right, this thing inside of quotes here, and it just shoots it out onto the screen. Wherever you ran this program, it's just going to print that out. They're going to see it. It's not going to print it to a printer or anything like that. We're not going to play around with printers. It's just going to print it to the screen so that they can see it. That's all that that's going to do. And then finally, we're actually going to wait for the user to type something in, hit enter, and then we're going to grab that value and we're going to put it inside of our input variable. Now things are starting to look complicated, but bear with me for a second and we'll break this down even further. First, we have our standard in function, right? We brought this in up here. This is the function from the standard library. And all this is going to do is it's going to give our program access to the standard input buffer. It's going to hook into wherever the user was typing. It's going to start listening for what that user is typing. It's going to do something with that. Then we're going to tell standard in what we want to do with that. We're going to chain this other function on the end of that. You'll see a lot of this. Anytime you see one of these periods, you can be pretty confident that we're, we're doing something and then something and then something. Here, we're taking standard input and we're reading a line. We're just going to read one single line from standard input. What does reading one line do for us? It essentially says, we're going to take whatever the user types up until they press the enter key, right? Then they're going to send a new line. And you remember when we talked about white space in the last chapter, that, that enter key is going to print out that new line character for us, sort of an invisible character. And it's going to finish listening from standard input, and it's going to put whatever they typed into our input variable, which we made up here. Right. It's going to take whatever they have on standard input, read a whole line of it, and dump it inside of the input variable. And this syntax here is is very Rust-specific way of saying, don't forget, you can go ahead and modify this. I want you to be able to change it. And these are all safety mechanisms that we'll talk more about later. But that's all we've done here is we have read whatever the user typed, 
up to when they push the enter key and we stuffed it into our input variable. Now we've, now we've got that information. However, that read line function provides us with two different possibilities. Either things worked out okay, and then the user actually typed something and hit enter, just like we expect, or things didn't work out okay. And more often than not, you'll find out that you need to do error handling to make sure that things were okay, right? And we're going to talk about this more. We already mentioned it a little bit, but error handling is something that you have to think about when you're writing a program, when you're solving a problem. And that's why here we add on to the end of that, oh, by the way, whatever comes back from that read line, I want you to tell them that they have to provide something or say no radius was given. So if the user doesn't type anything, if they quit the program without typing anything, or if they try to type nothing and just hit enter, go ahead and say no radius was given and we'll quit here. And that's what this expect does. This is just saying, I expect them to provide something here, but if they don't, tell them no radius was given and we'll quit the entire program. We'll quit the entire program. Let's go ahead and take a look at what that looks like just so you can get an idea for this first section, right? Step one here, prompting for an input. Now you can kind of see if we go ahead and run our circumference program again, we've already started listening, right? It's waiting for me to type in something we know that that means we're in the middle of our, our read line here. It's waiting for me to press enter. And of course, it printed our message already. You didn't see anything visually happen when it created a new string up here. You're not going to. That's happening inside our program. That's happening inside in memory. But the input and output, right, the output of printing this message, we can see that. And then the input waiting for us to press enter right here, where my cursor is down here. It's just waiting for us to type something. And then when we finally do type something and press enter, that's when the program continues. Now, remember we had to do that error handling. What happens if the user just enters nothing? They just go ahead and, and try to continue. Uh, you can see that things don't work. There are errors that we have to account for. We're printing other messages later, uh, like, like you'll see, right? We have other expect statements down here to make sure, hey, if the user doesn't actually provide anything, or if there was a problem trying to hook into standard input, we're accounting for that and we're telling the user what went wrong. And we'll look at that more later. For now, let's move down to the next section here. This is a really short section, but it does a lot. That's, we're gonna have to break it down. Parse our input into a numeric radius. Again, right, invalid radius given like we just saw. If I type in junk, if I just type in letters and weird special characters, we're not gonna be able to calculate our circumference or, with that, but you know, it's not a valid number. So we need to tell the user, hey, you gotta go type in a number. Uh, and so that's what we're doing here. So we're creating another variable called radius, and we're going to convert input into a number and we're going to put that number inside of this radius variable. This is just a useful thing that you'll see as you're starting to learn to program. It's helpful to name variables, things that make sense, right? Input, radius, circumference. And it's also useful to create new variables from other ones and to store that information there instead of constantly storing everything in one variable. You can create a virtually unlimited number of variables to store things in. But here we're decorating this radius, not with the mute, not with this little M-U-T. Radius is not going to change, so we don't have to put that there. It's just a nice thing to do, guarantees that nowhere in our program is radius ever going to be transformed into something else, which is very nice. We are decorating it with this right here. And you kind of saw something that looked like this up here, right? This F64. This is a type. This is us saying that we want radius to be of a certain type. 
you'll remember in previous chapters we said there are string types, there are number types, just different ways of um, putting information into memory. Here we're saying that radius should be a very big floating point number. That means it can be a number with lots of decimal places at the end. Uh, it has lots of room to grow and get big if we need it to. That's what we're doing here. We'll learn more about all the different types that you have in Rust later, but this is us saying this is a 64-bit floating point number, big, big floating point number, as opposed to a string, right? This kind of syntax is optional, as you'll learn later. It's only required in specific situations, right? We didn't have to put it in front of or after our input here. The Rust compiler, and this is sort of an aside for now, it's very, very good at guessing what you mean in a lot of cases. And if it's not able to guess, it's good at asking you what you mean or suggesting what you might mean in an error message. Up here, because input is being assigned to something from this string library, you know, hey, that's going to be a string. I can guess that. You don't have to tell me what type it is because I can infer what type it is. But here, we've got a lot of different stuff happening back here, which we'll talk about in a minute. Radius, it doesn't know what it's going to be yet. It needs us to tell it, so we're going to go ahead and tell it. You could provide this on every variable if you wanted to. But you don't have to, just sometimes you have to. And then we have our equal sign again. Everything after the equal sign is what we're going to stash inside of our variable over here. We've got an input. That's our variable from before. That's our string. We're going to trim it. This is a nice little string function that Rust provides for us. This just deletes any of the little white space characters on the side of our string. So if you typed in the number two and then you hit the space bar five times, I'm going to get rid of all those spaces. We don't need those spaces. It just cleans things up a little bit for us. Makes our string focus down on just the little number that we want. Then there's this parse. What does parse do? Well, you can go and check out the docs that I showed you before, right? The standard library. Parse is going to turn a string into a number. Strings and numbers are different things. And actually, a string can have a number in it, like 2, but that doesn't make it a numeric value that we can do calculations with. It's just text, like you would see on a page or like on this screen right here. We need to actually convert from one to the other. We can't do math with these guys. We can do math with these. We have to get from one to the other. And as you'll see, a lot throughout this course, converting from one to the other is just bread and butter. We're doing it all the time because everything that the user types is text, we're not sure if it's going to be a number. A lot of times we want it to be, and we're going to have to run this parse in order to turn our string into our floating point number that we can do math with. Now, doesn't that sound like something that can go wrong? Uh, and as we already demonstrated, right, we have another I expect that to work. I expect that to turn into a number that I can do math with. But just in case what they typed doesn't, go ahead and print this message and quit. We're done. Because I need more, I need better information from them. Just tell them that the radius is invalid uh, and they have to provide a different one. And so that's what we're doing here. So just to recap, creating a new variable, which will have a floating point number in it, we're going to set it to our input trimmed and parsed into a number, a floating point number. And if it didn't work, we're going to tell the user why. And we're going to quit. This expect is always going to quit. All right. Now we've got our actual radius. Now we can begin to run the functions uh, that we already knew about. And this next section is actually pretty easy because now we have nice numbers in memory. We can do math with them, do whatever we want. Uh, and you can see here are our formulas, just like, just like we saw here, right? So we've got a new variable for circumference. We don't need to change it. We just need to set it once. We're going to set it equal to our circumference formula. And you can see in here, we got 2.0, the number 2. As a decimal, but you know it's a whole number, so we got the number two. 
And we're going to use our little asterisk here to multiply. We're going to multiply that by pi. We brought in pi. That's not a variable that we created. That's our constant from the library that we're borrowing. That's the big, big, long number that we got from the web, right? That's this right here. We can reference that right here. Just multiply it, do math. Uh, Peter knows how to do math a lot better than I do. It's just going to go multiply those two numbers together, get us lots of decimal points out the end, uh, and then we're going to keep multiplying. You can add more operators here if you want to. We'll talk more about operators later, just like everything you're seeing in this file. <laughs> we have a theme of talking about it later. But here we're multiplying it by our radius. This is our 2 pi r formula in code being stored inside of our circumference variable. This is probably the easiest part of the program is just doing the math. We don't even have to do the math. We just have to <laughs> remember the formula. And then we've got our area. And you remember our area formula is uh, pi r squared. It's a little bit difficult because we need to square a number. We need to take it to the power of 2. Uh, and luckily, everything in Rust has a bunch of helper functions on them that we can use. You can go and read the docs, but just like strings have trim and numbers have, or strings have parts that turn them into numbers, numbers have the power to an integer function. This is the same thing as the little caret or the little superscript 2. This is saying take radius to the second power or really whatever power you put in here, but we want it to be squared, so we put in the power of two. And there's our pi again, we're multiplying that by pi. So here is stash pi times radius squared, radius to the second power inside of area. Done. Now we've got our two formulas. The only thing left for us to do, the easiest part of our program is to print out those numbers and there's our print line function again. Makes it very, very easy for us. We just provided another string inside of quotes. We got this little message here. The circumference is blank. And then we got these little curly braces. This is really convenient. If you put anything inside these curly braces, Rust is smart enough to think they're probably talking about a variable there. So let me go and just stuff whatever was in that variable inside this string when I print it. So it's not going to print out onto the console curly brace, the word circumference curly brace. It's going to take this whole thing, strip it out, grab whatever value our circumference variable has, and put it there instead. And then, of course, our area is the same thing. We're going to tell the user the area is, and then it's going to shove the area in there. We close that out. And then there's the end of our function. The program ends here. Once it reaches this, it quits automatically. That's the end of it. This is our program in its entirety. This is everything that you need to know to have a program which calculates area and circumference, takes user input, prints user output, and does error handling. It's got everything. That's why this is such a great place to start and why I borrowed it from this textbook here. Uh, not only does it do something useful, and you can use it to do homework if you wanted to, but you learn a lot right off the bat. Now, a lot of it's still very new, a lot of it's still very confusing. We're going to learn more about it in the coming chapters. We're going to take every piece of this and we're going to learn more about it. But if you're interested, play around with this. See if you can make changes, change messages, see what happens when you type in errors on purpose, see what happens when you change up some of the code in here. Uh, you can always use the Rust book, which I provide at the beginning of every chapter, uh, and you can use the documentation on that website that I provided as well. They both have lots of good information. But go ahead and see what you can do with it, see what you can learn by doing. Remember, practice is the best way to learn. The only way that we can get better at programming is through practice. So thanks for coming through this whirlwind first experience. Uh, in the next couple chapters, we're going to break down all of the parts of a program. We're going to look at all of these individual pieces, talk about them, what the, some of the rules are and the syntax are. 
and then give you the resources you need to start writing your own programs.